This episode of Do You Want to Hear a Story is intended for adult audiences. It may contain graphic descriptions and coarse language. Listener discretion is advised. In my opinion, this is by far the scariest story we've told on the podcast. This is the unfortunate telling of Gypsy Rose and Dee Dee Blanchard. The horror story that was Gypsy's life, fraught with child abuse, manipulation, fraud and murder. Do you want to hear a story? Will you give a few seconds of your time? Good evening, folks. Kennedy can die. The atomic power plant in the city of Kiev was damaged. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? The energy crisis were gathered in South Africa. Do you want to hear my story? This is in the case of State of Missouri versus Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Would you state your name for the record, please? Gypsy Blanchard. And how old are you? I'm going to be 25 years old at 24. Okay. And how far did you go in school? Um, about the second grade. How do you plead to the Class A felony of murder in the second degree? Guilty. The court finds that there is a factual basis for a plea of guilty. The court accepts the defendant's plea of guilty and finds the defendant guilty thereof beyond a reasonable doubt. It's important to have somewhat of an understanding of Munchausen syndrome. It's a factitious disorder, a mental disorder, in which a person repeatedly and deliberately acts as if they have a physical or mental illness when they are not really sick. Munchausen syndrome is considered a mental illness because it is associated with severe emotional difficulties. To me, this story is such a sad story. It's a horror story built on an extremely complex web of lies, all centering around Claudine Blanchard, better known as Dee Dee, and her daughter Gypsy as an extremely unwilling accomplice. The best place to start is with trying to understand who was Dee Dee Blanchard. At the time of her death, Dee Dee was 48 years old. Originally from Louisiana, she was a large happy lady, often dressing in bright and cheerful dresses. People who knew her said she was often generous with her time and when she could be with her money as well. She had the ability to make friends wherever she went. She did not have a job, but instead, she served as a full-time caregiver for her daughter, Gypsy Rose. And I'm sure if you met Dee Dee in her time with Gypsy, on the surface, she would have presented as a loving mother, doing all she could to take care of her poor, wheelchair-bound daughter with a never-ending list of illnesses. Epilepsy, muscular dystrophy, lung disease, leukemia, asthma, all while being both vision and hearing impaired. But by all accounts, of the people that really knew her, her family. She was far from a caring, loving person. Stories told about her by her aunts and uncles, mum and dad, brothers and sisters, her nephew, her ex-husband. They paint an extremely hard to look at picture. Everyone close to her could tell a story of how she'd either stolen thousands of dollars from them, opened up credit cards in their name and ran up huge debts, to how everyone was also convinced that she was directly involved with the death of her own mother. She let her elderly mother go days and days without food or giving her a shower over and over again. When her family was originally informed of her death, their first thought, this must be just another one of her schemes. And even though this story ultimately ends with Dee Dee's murder, the most common way people still seem to describe her is evil. I think she got what she deserved. According to yes. the user, yes. Yeah, she got what she deserved. And all the, all the brothers and sisters don't care about the D no more. Gypsy, uh, she got cremated. She said, what you want me to do with the ashes? 
Everybody said, oh, I don't want her. I Daughter don't want her. Flushing. I don't. Flush that in the toilet. <laughs> they want her sister said, flush that in the toilet. She said, we're going to bring that in mama's room, make her mask and everything. I said, you're going you gonna to pay for it? I'm not paying for it. You're going to get that. They said, we can't afford it. I said, flush it in the toilet. When she was 24, she became pregnant to Rod Blanchard, who was then 17. They named their daughter Gypsy Rose because Dee Dee liked the name Gypsy, and Rod was a fan of Guns N' Roses. Shortly before Gypsy Rose's birth in July 1991, the couple separated when Rod realised he got married for all the wrong reasons. He resisted Dee Dee's efforts to get him to return, and she ended up taking her newborn daughter to live with her family. Gypsy was a healthy baby, but the suffering began early for Gypsy. When she was just three months old, Dee Dee became obsessed with the idea that her baby had sleep apnea, and that Gypsy would stop breathing in the night. Convinced that there was an issue, Dee Dee began taking her to hospital. Despite numerous tests and multiple nights on a sleep monitor, the doctors couldn't find anything wrong with Gypsy. But Dee Dee was convinced her daughter was ill. She explained the growing array of problems to Rod by saying that Gypsy had a chromosomal defect. Many of Gypsy's health issues she claimed stem from that one thing. Gypsy Rose, in her teens, was only five foot tall or so confined to a wheelchair, which her mother put her in after she fell off the back of her grandfather's motorcycle. Nothing but a scraped and bruised knee in reality, but enough to end up in a wheelchair as far as Dee Dee was concerned. She was skinny, underweight really, with large round glasses, missing teeth, most often followed by an oxygen tank. Given the opportunity, Dee Dee loved to tell anyone who would listen all the illnesses that plagued her daughter. At this point, it might not surprise you to find out Dee Dee did not allow Gypsy to attend school, and rather opted for homeschooling. Something that many later assumed was a further tool used by Dee Dee to control Gypsy's ability to never ever find out the truth. While Gypsy was still young, the two were living with Dee Dee's father and stepmother. They would later claim that Dee Dee, when preparing food for her stepmother, poisoned it with weed killer, leading to her own chronic illnesses during this period. During that time, she was also arrested for several minor offences, including writing bad checks. And in the early 2000s, when the family began to regularly confront her about her treatment of Gypsy and express suspicion in her role in her stepmother's health, she left with Gypsy and moved about two hours away to Slidell. Surprisingly, her stepmother's health returned to normal shortly afterwards. In Slidell, she and Gypsy lived in public housing. They paid their bills with Rod's child support payments and public assistance that Dee Dee had been granted due to her daughter's supposed medical conditions. They spent most of their time visiting various specialists and doctors, seeking treatment for all the illnesses Dee Dee claimed Gypsy suffered from. While a muscle biopsy found no sign of the muscular dystrophy that Dee Dee insisted Gypsy had, she was successful in securing treatment for her daughter's other apparent issues. After she told the doctors Gypsy had seizures every few months, they prescribed anti-seizure medication. Several surgeries were performed on her during this time and Dee Dee regularly took Gypsy to the emergency room. It all spiralled so quickly. Dee Dee always had a new idea about what was wrong with Gypsy. A new doctor, a new drug. She'd once worked as a nurse's aide and she had a skill for remembering medical terminology and firing it right back. The information overload acted as a force field around the two. It always seemed that Dee Dee had things under control. She knew so much and she welcomed questions because she always had the answer. Behind the bubbly, cheery mum, she was skilled to the highest level of manipulation. After Hurricane Katrina devastated the area in August 2005, Dee Dee and Gypsy left their ruined apartment for a shelter set up for individuals with special needs. Dee Dee and Gypsy's medical records, including a birth certificate, had been destroyed in the flooding. And it was a doctor there that suggested they relocate back to her native Missouri. In the next month free of charge, they were airlifted back. Now, after the move, at the real age of 15, Gypsy was honored by the Olay Foundation, which advocates for the rights of feeding tube recipients as its 2007 Child of the Year. I say real age because Dee Dee wanted to keep her young. Controlling a 10 or 11 year old is much easier than a 15 or a 16 year old. 
And with everything she was already lying about, changing Gypsy's age was not an issue for her. Unfortunately for Gypsy, the honour of the Ole Foundation was nowhere near enough to make up for the fact that she'd been using a feeding tube for many years at this point. Something she did not need. It did, however, provide an extremely easy way for Dee Dee to control her. Control her medication, control what she ate, sometimes both of which she could do without even waking her. In 2008, Gypsy and Dee Dee moved into a new home in Springfield, Missouri, built by Habitat for Humanity. It was painted pink, and it had a wheelchair ramp out the front. All along, Dee Dee continued to bask in the attention she received for being a devoted mother and caretaker. On paper, things had worked out perfectly for Dee Dee. The story of a single mother with a severely disabled daughter forced to flee Katrina's devastation. As you can imagine, the two received considerable local media attention, and the community often pitched in to help. Their house, like everyone's around them, had been built by Habitat for Humanity. And it had the special amenities, including that ramp out the front. It also had a hot tub to help with Gypsy's muscles. And sometimes on warm nights, Dee Dee would set up a projector to play a movie on the side of her house. And the children from the neighborhood, whose parents usually couldn't afford to send them to a movie theater, would come over for a movie night. Not missing an opportunity to take advantage of someone, Dee Dee charged all these kids to come watch a movie. This money was to go to Gypsy's apparent medical treatments. While Gypsy had been involved with charities for children with disabilities from the time she was quite small, Dee Dee often stayed at the Ronald McDonald house. This was obviously the largest benefit that Dee Dee had managed to wrangle. It seemed to give her a desire for more though. While in Springfield, they benefited from free flights, stays at special lodges for cancer patients, free trips to Disney World through various different charity organizations, and the chance to meet Miranda Lambert through the Make-A-Wish Foundation. In addition to the free house that was built for them, Rod continued to make his monthly child support payments of $1,200, as well as sending Gypsy gifts and talking to her on the phone. As a side note here, Rod, unfortunately, as did everyone, believed that his daughter really was suffering and that Dee Dee was doing everything she could to take care of their daughter. Rod would make attempt after attempt to come and visit Gypsy, but Dee Dee always managed to scheme her way out of his visit. A caring father just didn't fit the narrative. Rather, Dee Dee had told all her friends and neighbors that Rod was a drug addict and an alcoholic and someone who was never able to come to terms with his daughter's illnesses. So here you have this poor girl, betrayed by the one person you always feel like you can trust and rely on, convinced that she's sick, wheelchair bound, in need of a feeding tube, over 150 hospital visits, multiple surgeries, including having her teeth removed due to malnourishment and decay caused by all the medication she was on, and having her salivary glands removed to control the drooling. The drooling that Gypsy would later claim that her mother would induce with an anesthetic before each visit to the doctors, numbing her gums. She had tubes inserted into her ears to treat various hearing conditions. And not only is her mother doing all of this, using her to create a world of emotional gratification for herself, but Gypsy spent majority of her life not knowing how old she was. It was on her 18th birthday that her father called, wanting to wish her happy birthday. And Dee Dee intercepted the call and asked him not to mention the fact that she was 18. She said that Gypsy still thought she was only 14 and she didn't want to upset her. Not far from her 18th birthday, a pediatric neurologist, Bernardo Flastacine, who saw Gypsy became suspicious of her muscular dystrophy diagnosis. He ordered MRIs and blood tests which found no abnormalities. I don't see any reason why she doesn't walk, he told Dee Dee on a follow-up visit after seeing Gypsy stand up and support her own weight. Flastacine noted that Dee Dee was not a good historian. After contacting Gypsy's doctors in New Orleans, he learned that Gypsy's original muscle biopsy had come back negative, undermining Dee Dee's self-reported diagnosis of muscular dystrophy. As well as her claim that Gypsy's records had been destroyed by flooding, he suspected the possibility of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Dee Dee schemed to gain access to Flastacine's notes and subsequently stopped taking Gypsy to see him. Unfortunately, Flastacine did not follow up by reporting Dee Dee to social services. 
He said he doubted the authorities would believe him. But in 2009, an anonymous caller told the police about Dee Dee's use of different names and birth dates for herself and her daughter, and suggested Gypsy was in better health than claimed. Officers who performed the resulting wellness check accepted Dee Dee's explanation that she used the misinformation to make it harder for her abusive ex-husband to find her and Gypsy. Without talking to Rod, and reported that Gypsy seemed to genuinely be mentally handicapped, the file was closed. Unfortunately, Gypsy slipped through every gap imaginable. From the doctors, family members, neighbours, police, and everyone in her life, Dee Dee did such an amazing job of convincing everyone. No one was ever given a reason to question, is everything okay? And I feel like this is where the second half of the story begins. During a hospital visit, Gypsy saw a copy of her real birth certificate. And when she questioned her mother, she was told it was nothing but a misprint and to forget about it. Despite her mother's efforts though, Gypsy was not mentally challenged. She was now 20 years old and she began to grow suspicious of her mother and her apparent illnesses and her current situation. In 2011, Gypsy made her first attempt to get away from her mother by running away with a man that she'd met at a science fiction convention. The conventions were something she'd been attending for the last 10 years. Her mother obviously hadn't planned that she'd begin to connect with other people that would begin to lead to a number of unanswerable questions. Dee Dee soon tracked them down via mutual friends and she convinced the man that Gypsy was a minor, even though she was 20 at the time, but she had the fake birth certificates to use as evidence. Once home, this did not sit well with Dee Dee at all. She kept Gypsy restrained with handcuffs and a dog leash. She smashed her computer and threatened that she would break all her fingers if she ever attempted something like this again. All while repeating past behavior, denying her showers and food. Something that Dee Dee was obviously not prepared for was Gypsy maturing. As a child, it was easy for Dee Dee to manipulate Gypsy and the people around them. It was easy for Dee Dee to control any and all interactions she had with others. Dee Dee was essentially a filter between the world and Gypsy. She never allowed her to speak to her doctors, and it was said by many that whenever the two were in public together, Dee Dee would hold Gypsy's hand, something Gypsy later said was a way that she would control her whilst in the public eye. The amount of pressure she applied to her hand was how she controlled what Gypsy did and didn't say to others. As they often do, Gypsy found another way to access the internet. On a new computer that her mother had purchased after smashing the old one, Gypsy would wait till her mother fell asleep each night. On the internet, Gypsy was just like any other 20 year old, not prohibited by her supposed illness, not bound to a wheelchair and not controlled by her mother. She had five different Facebook accounts filled with selfies. She joined and met people in chat rooms. And she joined dating websites. It was on a Christian dating website that she would meet Nicholas Godijon, the man who would eventually become responsible for Dee Dee's murder. Gypsy arranged and paid for Godijon to meet her in Springfield. Her plan was for him to just bump into her while she and Dee Dee were at the movie theater and apparently strike up a relationship that way. Then for her to introduce him to her mother. You've got to remember, Gypsy had no other avenue to meet people. She couldn't introduce Nicholas to her mother and say, this is someone that I've met online. Dee Dee knew everyone that Gypsy was in contact with. As soon as they did meet in person for the first time, Gody John said in a police interrogation, Gypsy led him into the bathroom where the two had sex. Their relationship continued to grow online where the two would eventually begin planning her escape. Fueled by young love and Gypsy's desire for freedom, the two began to plan exactly how it would happen. Over the course of six months, the two went back and forth and the relationship developed. And in Gypsy's own words, it all came to a culmination when she realized without some sort of drastic action, her life was never going to change. After the two scraped enough money together for Nick to come back to Springfield, this is the conversation the two had via text on the night of Dee Dee's murder. I've left the gloves outside the front door. The screen door is squeaky, so try and open it just enough to get in and close it gently. I'll hand you the knife and duct tape as you come in, darling. 
I'm doing my nails too. I'm painting them a dark pink. We paint each other's nails. <laughs> and I acted like everything was fine. We had just recently gotten into an argument and we had made up. And I said I was gonna be a good girl. <laughs> and then she, and she went to sleep. I guess I hurt her feelings or something. She said, I'm starting to feel more relaxed. Don't hurt me. The last word she said to me was, don't hurt me. Nick responds, I'm here. And get your ass to the bathroom. You open the door. Gypsy responds, yes, sir. I'm going now, sir. I went into the bathroom. I got... I'm in a fetal position and I cover my ears. And um, then I heard my mom wake up. And then she sounded startled. And there was some noises that I can't make out. And I heard her say my name a couple times. And, um, and she said, help me. And then there was just silence. Gypsy hid in the bathroom and covered her ears so that she would not have to hear her mother screaming. Goaty John then stabbed Dee Dee several times in the back while she was asleep. The two had sex in Gypsy's room straight after, a deal that Gypsy had made with Nick to avoid him raping Dee Dee before he murdered her. After which the two took $4,000 in cash, all that Dee Dee had. They fled to a motel outside Springfield where they stayed for a few days while planning their next move. During that time, they were seen on security cameras at several local stores and restaurants. Gypsy said at that point she believed the two had managed to get away with the crime. They mailed the murder weapon back to Goaty John's house in Wisconsin to avoid being caught with it, and then they took a bus there. Several witnesses saw the pair on their way to the Greyhound station and noted that Gypsy wore a blonde wig and was walking unassisted. The Facebook post was, quote, the bitch is dead, and another post stating, I fucking slashed that fat pig and raped her sweet innocent daughter. Her scream was so fucking loud, lol. What you've just heard were the Facebook posts posted to the account that Gypsy and Dee Dee shared. It took very little for the police to track the two down after a neighbour tipped off police to the fact that Gypsy had a secret boyfriend. After it all came to light just how Dee Dee had treated Gypsy all these years, sympathy for Dee Dee as the victim of a violent murder rapidly shifted to her daughter as a long-term victim of child abuse, a hostage in her own home. The fact is, Gypsy hadn't used a wheelchair from the moment she left the house a few days earlier. She didn't need one. She never needed one. She could walk just fine. There was nothing wrong with her muscles, as previously stated by a number of doctors, and she had no medication or oxygen tank with her either, both of which she had no need for. Her hair was short and spiky, but she wasn't bald. Her head had simply been shaved all those years to make her appear ill. She was well-spoken, finally out of the grasp of her mother, not suffering from mental or physical illness. The disabled child she'd long been in the eyes of others was nowhere to be found. It was all a lie. She told that to the police, all of it. From day one, her mother had made her do it. In her mind, she had no other choice. Dee Dee obviously won't be able to answer anyone's questions. For always, we'll only have Gypsy's story. Unfortunately, Gypsy's side of the story is vague at best. She's confused on a majority of the details. For example, when she was arrested, Gypsy told the police that she was 19. Rod and his wife were able to straighten that out by giving authorities Gypsy's real birth certificates. She was actually 23. I think most would agree on a subconscious level. We are somewhat of a product of our environment, especially in our early years. And unfortunately for Gypsy, Dee Dee created an environment where she did have cancer. To this day, Gypsy is still very unclear on what medication she was actually given over those years. She knew the bottles and what each medication was supposedly for, but she couldn't actually say what she'd been taking. 
a number of people now believe that Didi was giving Gypsy tranquilizers. I started this story talking about Munchausen syndrome, but this is really a story of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. A diagnosis of Munchausen syndrome by proxy is attached to the perpetrator, not to the victim. And because Dee Dee is now dead, it's impossible to actually diagnose her. She never left behind a diary. She never told anybody. There's no way to know exactly what her intentions or her plans were. She did, however, keep a binder of all the medical information she kept on Gypsy, including which records she would share with which doctors. Unfortunately, retrospectively, she definitely fit certain parameters that doctors often cite as red flags for Munchausen syndrome. For example, she had medical training, the number of doctors she took Gypsy to see over all those years, and her constantly changing location so that there was no clear medical trail is also all common. Interestingly enough, the concerns over sleep apnea is one way that Munchausen syndrome often seems to begin in a various number of documented cases. In documented cases, it's also highly usual for people close to the perpetrator and the victim to have no idea what's actually happening. Those suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy are often very intelligent and highly manipulative. They manipulate their victims, and the longer it goes on, the higher the chances are that the victim might begin to collude with the perpetrator. The desire to please a parent can be more than enough for a child to become complicit in the deception. But even in adult cases, there can be some kind of emotional attachment keeping the victim in on the lie. The relationship that develops between the two is so unhealthy. There's one thing that's certain. For the perpetrator in a Munchausen by proxy case, the truth becomes unimportant. As for Gypsy and Nick, the charge of first degree murder can carry the death penalty under Missouri law or life without parole. In this particular case, the prosecutor announced he would not seek it for either Gypsy or Nick, calling the case extraordinary and unusual. After her attorney obtained her medical records from Louisiana, which proved to be an extremely complex task, he secured a plea bargain for a second degree murder for Gypsy. She was so undernourished for all those years with her mother that during the year she was in county jail, she gained almost seven kilos. In contrast to most who in that situation lose weight. In July 2015, she accepted the plea bargain and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Nicholas Godijohn still faced the more severe charge because prosecutors contended that he initiated the murder plot and both he and Gypsy agreed that he would be the one to actually kill Dee Dee. In January 2017, his trial was postponed when prosecutors requested a second psychiatric exam. His lawyers contended that he only had an IQ of 82 and he was on the autism spectrum, suggesting that he has diminished capacity. He had initially waived his right to a trial by jury, but changed his mind in June of that year. By December 2017, the judge had set Gody John's trial for November 2018. In their opening statements, prosecutors alleged that Gody John had deliberated for over a year before the crime, while his lawyers pointed to his autism and said that Gypsy had formulated the crime and their love-struck client had just done as she had asked. The next day, prosecutors showed jurors the text messages, sometimes sexually explicit, that Gypsy and Gody John had shared in the week before the murder, as well as the knife which he had used to commit the murder. In some of the texts, he'd asked for details about Dee Dee's room and her sleeping habits. These were supplemented by a video of his interview with police after his arrest, where he admitted to having killed her. Gypsy did testify on the trial's third day. She said that while she had indeed suggested to go to John that he killed Dee Dee to end her mother's abuse, she had also considered getting pregnant to him in the hope that once she was carrying go to John's child, Dee Dee would have to accept him. Along with the knife that she'd eventually gave to go to John, she stole baby clothes from Walmart during a shopping trip so she could go ahead with either plan. However, she said go to John never told her what he thought about the pregnancy plan. After four days, the case was sent to the jury. Jurors had the option of finding Gody John not guilty or guilty of one of three murder charges. Involuntary manslaughter, second degree murder or first degree murder. After approximately two hours of deliberation, they returned with the verdict and Gody John was found guilty of first degree murder and armed criminal action. 
In February 2019, he was sentenced to life in prison for the murder conviction. The only possible option since prosecutors had declined to seek the death penalty. Go to John asked Judge David Jones for leniency on the armed criminal action charge, which carries a minimum sentence of only three years, saying that he'd fallen blindly in love with Gypsy. He received a sentence of 25 years on that charge, which is running concurrently with the life sentence. Speaking with a reporter from prison, Gypsy wants people to know that this wasn't a situation where a girl killed her mum to be with her boyfriend. This was a situation she said of a girl trying to escape abuse. In prison, she's hoping to join all sorts of programs to help people. She wants to write a book to help others in her situation. When she was asked when she realized her life was different, that there was something wrong, whenever I was 19, she replied. She meant the time that she ran away with the man from the convention in 2011. When her mother came to take her back, she began to wonder why she wasn't allowed to be alone or to have friends. When asked about her mother, she said, I think she would have been the perfect mum for someone that was actually sick, but I'm not sick. There's that big, big difference. Gypsy still doesn't feel like she actively deceived anyone. From prison, she said, I feel like I was just as used as everybody else. She used me as a pawn. I was in the dark about it all. The only thing I knew was that I could walk and that I could eat. As for everything else, well, she'd shave my hair off and she'd say, it's all gonna fall out anyway, so let's keep it nice and neat. Unfortunately, it didn't occur to her to question any of it. And when she did, she worried about hurting her mum's feelings. It seems to Gypsy, even now, Dee Dee really believed she was sick. I was afraid that I was gonna get into a lot of trouble, Gypsy said. The line between right and wrong was kind of blurred because that's the way I was taught. I just grew up that way. And when I think about it now, she added, I wish I would have reached out to somebody and told somebody before I told Nick. Gypsy will be eligible for parole in 2024. Over here, I feel like I'm freer in prison than with my, living with my mom because now I'm allowed to just live like a normal woman. Prison isn't normal. No, not for most, but for me it is.